Well, you're brave people to come out on a night like this. Okay. 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 Good. Landed outside. Okay. 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 So, a very famous German philosopher called Arthur Schopenhauer said at one stage, he said, all truth goes through three stages. The first stage is it's ridiculed. The second stage is that it's violently opposed. And the third stage is people say it's self-evident. So when it gets finally accepted. And that's been the history of all great ideas and all great phenomena and all great movements in human history. Initially, they're ridiculed because they're upsetting you know, our paradigm, our belief systems. And then they get violently opposed because they're really kind of doing a number on the status quo and those who hold the power. And then finally, when everybody's accepted it, the people who opposed it and ridiculed it says, it's obvious, everybody knew that. Now, that is my opinion personally about the topic we're dealing with tonight. It depends on where you are in the world at the moment. You're either at the ridicule stage or the violent opposition stage or it's self-evident stage. Personally, I'm at the self-evident stage. Yeah, I've been studying this topic for many, many, many years, and I'm hoping I'll produce, I'll produce a whole bunch of evidence tonight, uh, two kinds of evidence, ancient evidence from ancient sources and modern evidence, so that you have more data with which to make up your own minds about this. So as you can see from the outline, I've created just four uh, sections to it. The first is just an introductory section where I'm going to talk about uh, the terminology uh, words you may have heard or read about what they, what they mean. And then the second section is about ancient evidence for the reality of ETs or UFOs. And then the third section is more modern evidence for it. And then the fourth piece is, it's about disclosure. Where do we go from, from there? So I just want to explain the terms that I'm using because sometimes they get mixed up in the popular parlance. And so a UFO just literally means an unidentified flying object. It does not necessarily mean something of extraterrestrial origin. And so when the term is used UFO, it just means it can't be identified. And sometimes it can't be identified because the observers don't know a whole lot. And sometimes it can't be uh, identified because it, the data themselves aren't very, very obvious. So the fact that something is a UFO does not necessarily mean of its, that it's of extraterrestrial origin. Uh, so it's important to keep that in mind. In fact, the, the, all the great studies, those who have compiled them, you know, only a very small percentage fall into the category that it is probably, or in the opinion of the researchers, of extraterrestrial origin. The bulk of UFOs, you know, they're UFOs because people observing them don't, don't know what they're looking at. So there could, be, there could be weather phenomena or there could be advanced aircraft. So for many reasons, they could be unidentified, but not necessarily of extraterrestrial origin. But obviously, I'm interested mainly in that percentage, which when you rule out everything else, for a whole bunch of reasons, appear to be of extraterrestrial origin. And so that's the evidence I'd be adducing tonight. But I want you just to be sure on the terminology I'm using. A second uh, word you'll come across uh, sometimes, if you dig deeply enough, is USO. Not UFO, but USO. Because more and more uh, recently, a whole bunch of observations have been made about unidentified submerged objects that come out of the ocean. So there seem to be some kinds of bases or they're down there someplace. So they're coming out of the ocean and they're called USOs, unidentified submerged objects. Another term that you find used in the scientific literature is UAP, uh, which would be unidentified aerial phenomena. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's happening in the skies. It, they may not be craft. They may be other like weather phenomena. Or so a more general term is UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. So these are the terms you'll come across when you start digging into the, into the data. So that's about the craft. What about the beings? If we're talking about you know, UFOs, are there beings attached to them? And mainly, you see the word, the word ET for extraterrestrial. Extra means beyond. So terrestrial, terra from meaning the Earth. So beings who are from beyond the Earth. So that's the normal term you'll see used, ETs, or extraterrestrials. In the scientific literature, they use a different term. They use EBE, which means extraterrestrial biological entities. 
So you'll come across that quite a bit when you start digging in. EBEs stand for extraterrestrial biological entities. And that's to kind of separate them from, uh, occasionally you have, there, there have been uh, reported encounters with a kind of robotic figures who seem to be some kind of intelligent uh, d designed robots, but they're not biological entities. They have a great intelligence, they seem to be manning some of these craft, but they're not of biological origin. So to distinguish between them, they talk about EBEs, extraterrestrial biological entities. So biological entities, you know, that are not from planet Earth. So that's a term you'll come across. A fascinating other term that I want to emphasize is the term ultra-terrestrials. Not extraterrestrials, but ultra-terrestrials. So where extraterrestrials tend to be biological creatures of various kinds from other parts of the galaxy or, or the galaxies, when you talk about uh, ultra-terrestrials, you're talking about entities that seem to be trans-dimensional and trans-temporal. In other words, they're not bound by time as we know it. So they're time travelers. They have the ability to go backwards and forward in how we perceive to be time. And they have the ability to shift dimensions. So they have the ability to appear on some occasions and even to make their craft appear in physical reality. But for the main part, they don't exist in physical reality. So they're ultra-terrestrials. They have the ability to move in and out of physical location, both as beings and with the craft uh, that they're maneuvering in. So there's the terms. Uh, those are the terms. Trans-temporal. Trans beyond time. So they can, sh they can shift in and out between times. So there's a whole theory, in fact, that many of the encounters that people are having are, in fact, encounters with future human beings who've learned how to time travel and that they're coming back in time and that some of the encounters are the human species, maybe in a thousand years time, who have mastered the ability of time and are learning to time travel and are coming back and interfacing and interacting with us. So those are the terms I'll use. So that's just kind of to kind of clear up the terminology. The first big section that I want to talk about, I want to look at what for me constitutes various kinds of evidence to suggest that in fact there are extraterrestrials who have visited, visited us in the past. And the first point I'll make is, I want to look at the age of our universe and the age of the Earth itself. And the first thing is to realize that according to, according to quantum mechanical theory, there are 10 to the power of 27 brand new universes created every second for every cubic centimeter of 11 dimensional mathematical space. Now most of them are mathematical duds, but even if the tiniest fraction of them survive, it means there are just gazillions of universes out there. And I'm of the opinion that the, this universe that we inhabit at the moment is the daughter of a meta-universe, that it is a reincarnated uh, universe. So I believe personally that a black hole is a kind of a phenomenon whereby energy and information are condensed down to a pinpoint, transported through some kind of an interdimensional portal, and reinflated on the far side in one of two ways. Either reinflated to create the original or reconstructed. And the images I would use is imagine you're coming into a house and it's been rainy and you've got an umbrella up. And as you enter the house, you take the umbrella down and then you walk through the house and you go out onto the back porch and you reinflate it. So the umbrella that came in looks exactly like the umbrella that went out, but you took it down in the interim. So it may well be that our universe is a reinflated you know, version of the original, or it could be more like a Lego set, that it may well be that when the, the meta-universe reincarnates, it totally disassembles the constituent elements of the previous one and reorganizes them so you get a totally different outcome in, in the daughter universe. But wh whichever way it is, this here universe that we recognize is reckoned to be 13.7 billion years of age. Now our solar system and our planet is merely 4.6 billion years of age. So there are parts of our, this universe which are literally three times older than us. Now when you look at the extraordinary advances we've made even, you know, Bob here is a physicist. In Bob's lifetime as a physicist, the, the changes he's seen in the scientific world are phenomenal. Multiply that now by a million or by a billion and imagine what kind of technology and what kinds of abilities beings who may have evolved literally tens of a billion years before us, what kind of technology they might have. 
And so when you look at the age of our little our planet and our solar system and you compare it to the universe, it has to be that there are entities out there, that life evolved much earlier elsewhere, and that there are much more evolved entities out there than, than are we. Francis Drake was a famous radio astronomer of the 1950s. Um, he's still alive. He's a professor emeritus down in UC Santa Cruz. And he's the one, one of the people who founded the SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. He created a very famous formula in the 1950s which is an estimate when you plug in the values into the variables, there are about seven different variables in it. When you plug the values into the variables, he came up with an estimate that in the Milky Way galaxy alone, and the Milky Way galaxy is one of about 150 billion galaxies in this universe. But when you look at the Milky Way galaxy itself, he estimated, uh, the formula would estimate, the number of civilizations that have evolved just in the Milky Way galaxy, which have developed technology capable of communicating with people outside their own solar systems, or with civilizations outside their own solar systems. And he plugged in values very conservatively into this equation, and he came up with the number 10,000. So he believed there were probably around 10,000 such civilizations. His friend, Carl Sagan, who was the other co-founder of SETI, uh, plugged in different numbers, and he came up with an estimate that looked like more like 100,000. More recent estimates claim there may be up to the region of maybe 10 million. Uh, as we find exoplanets, it seems more and more likely that there are millions of uh, civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone that have developed technologies capable of communicating with civilizations outside their own solar systems. Now, a Russian scientist uh, typed these into three different groups. He called them very simply type 1, type 2, and type 3. A type 1 civilization is a civilization that has learned how to control its own planetary weather. And so it is totally capable of controlling its own planet, its weather patterns, and extracting energy from its own planet. A type 2 solar system, or a, civilization, a type 2 civilization, is a civilization that has learned how to domesticate its own solar system. So like if it were, if it were our solar system, there are nine planets. So these are civilizations that have domesticated their entire solar system and are able to draw energy from any part of that system. And a type 3 civilization, he believed, was a civilization that could act, had domesticated and was able to control its own galaxy. So you can imagine what these dudes would look like. So he talked about these three different types. He was asked, where do we fall? And his answer was, oh, we're the, uh, we're the type 0. <laughs> yeah, and the transition from type 0 to type 1 is the most dangerous transition of all. Because any civilization that's on the way to trying to control its own weather patterns is developing technology that can very, very easily destroy the entire planet. And we talked a little bit about this in this session on geoengineering uh, earlier in our series. And so it's a very difficult and a very dangerous transition to go from type 0 to type 1. So that's my first point then. The first point that I'm arguing is that the age of the solar system versus the age of the universe begs uh, for uh, the, the belief system that there's intelligence out there far, far beyond us. And if they are, they've traveled. And if they've traveled, they've discovered us. So that's my first uh, uh, bunch of evidence. The second would be uh, the timeline. According to Francis Crick, Sir Francis Crick, one of the discoverers of the DNA double helix, he believed, he was interviewed at one stage, and he quoted this theory that's called uh, directed panspermia. When you look at the evolution of life on planet Earth, the little window of time during which life erupted from non-organic matter is far too short to be able to, to be explained by any kind of evolutionary or Darwinian model. In fact, he came up with a very famous statement. He said, believing that life emerged spontaneously in the window of time in which it emerged on planet Earth is like believing that a hurricane swept through a junkyard and assembled a 707 in perfect working order. The, the timeline is far too short and the possibilities are, are, are astronomically huge. So <clears throat> he talked about uh, directed panspermia. And so what does directed panspermia mean? It means that spores of life from outer space have been directed onto planet Earth intentionally. And he was asked in an interview, how did this happen? How could spores of life survive in the intergalactic void and arrive safely and germinate? And he said, because they came in specially designed space capsules. 
So here is the discovery of DNA claiming that space capsules were sent to planet Earth, obviously by some kind of a previous intelligence, and that spores were brought onto the planet to begin the experiment. Now, I'm of the opinion that planet Earth is a little garden that has been discovered many, many, many times. So when I read the notion of the Garden of Eden, for me, the Garden of Eden is not some little place in the Middle East, you know, where God planted two trees and told us not to eat of them. The Garden of Eden is the planet itself. And indeed, it has been an experiment. And I'm convinced that possibly very many different uh, civilizations have visited this planet and seeded it in various ways. Now, if you know anything about gardening, there are several ways of influencing the outcome of your garden. The first one is periodic weeding. You need to uproot a whole bunch of stuff. And this has happened on five very significant occasions on planet Earth. They're called the Great uh, Extinctions. And there have been five such extinctions. And when you look at the fossil record, more than 95% of all life that's ever existed on planet Earth has been rendered extinct. You know, something, you know, wiped them out. In fact, with the last of these great extinctions is called the Permian, the Permian extinction, which happened about 245 million years ago. 95% of all life then on the planet was wiped out. And we could see this from the fossil record. So who's doing this wiping? Are these natural disasters? Are the gardeners coming back occasionally and saying, I don't like the rhododendron bush here anymore. I'm fed up with cabbage. You know, I've had enough you know, carrots. Let's pull everything out you know, and put down broccoli or something else. So the first thing you always do with your garden is you weed the stuff that you're fed up that you don't want. The second thing is you fertilize it. And so you put stuff that aids and abets it. Or you graft stuff onto pre-existing trees. Or you genetically modify these things. And we're doing it now. We've done it with plants for hundreds of years. We're beginning to do it with animals now, genetically modifying animals. And I talk about this in the next section as well. And so uh, I'm convinced that these gardeners who came onto this planet many, many times in the course of our history, you know, um, having sown originally, they adapted and they grafted and they fertilized and they weeded, you know, until they got more and more uh, advanced, kinds of, advanced kinds of life forms. So that's my second point then. Uh, looking at the, um, the, the time span for life to emerge is far too short uh, for it to have spontaneously combusted and then evolved as it has. As it has. The, the uh, section four here, so my third kind of evidence, is the genetic evidence. When you look at a human cell, um, the vast bulk of the DNA is contained inside the nucleus of the cell. In spite of the fact that the nucleus is not the brain of the cell. You can actually, you can enucleate a cell and it will survive for two or three months. Because uh, the nucleus is not the brain. The brain of the cell is actually the membrane of the cell. So you can enucleate a cell and it will survive for two or three months. But the DNA is found in the, nu in the nucleus. It's called nuclear DNA. And that accounts for the vast bulk of the DNA. But there are also little tiny organelles spread throughout the cell uh, which contain a different kind of uh, DNA. And this is called mitochondrial DNA. Now the interesting thing is mitochondrial DNA is passed down only by the woman. Uh, although men and women have mitochondrial DNA in the, every cell of their bodies, it's only carried on in the female lineage. <clears throat> and it has been scientifically demonstrated that all human uh, mitochondrial DNA goes back less than 200,000 years to a single female, who is called in the scientific literature mitochondrial Eve. So all human beings on planet Earth right now go back to a single female somewhere around 200,000 years ago. Now, it's interesting that since that time, in the last 200,000 years, the primates have not evolved at all. There's all been no evolution among the primates, but the human primates have evolved at an extraordinary rate. And so when you look at the, uh, the neocortex of the mammals, you know, the uh, later um, mammals, if you take the neocortex, that's the corrugated part of the surface of the brain, which is associated with uh, real high intelligence. If you were to flatten that out into a plane, you took a rat's brain and you spread it out, it would be about the size of a postage stamp, spread out. Um, if you took it for a monkey, it would be the size of a postage card, you know, a card that you sent from the post. If you took one of the primates, like a chimp, and you spread it out, it would be this, the size of this page here. If you took a human one, it's four times, four pages. That's how big it is. So somewhere in the last 200,000 years, when we uh, split from the primates, 
Just in the last 200,000 years, that split has resulted in our brains, the neocortex, being four times bigger than our nearest relatives, the chimps, although we share 98.6% of our DNA with them. So something radically has happened in the last 200,000 years to shift this uh, 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 forward. There's a, there's a technique called gene splicing, which is the ability to chemically cut a sequence of DNA. So if you get a sequence of DNA, you can literally chemically cut a section of it. You can invert it and reinsert it. You can transplant it someplace else in the DNA, or you can actually put it into a DNA, a DNA sequence of another species. Well, in fact, we've done it in the last 20 years. They've taken a DNA sequence from a lion and from a tiger and mixed them together and produced what's called a liger. I don't know if you've seen photographs of them. Ligers are a cross between tigers and lions, li lions and tigers. And they did it by chemical, it wasn't crossbreeding, it was genetically splicing. You take some, a sequence from DNA, you can put it into another species or just invert it where it is, turn it upside down. Now when you do that, there's room for lots of mistakes. And here's the interesting thing. When there is evidence when the human genome is, is uh, examined, that there, there is evidence of tampering with human DNA that there are sequences that have been inverted, spliced, and turned upside down and reinserted, are put in different positions. And that has resulted in, there, it has resulted in 4,000 significant mistakes in the human genome. When you compare that with the other primates, there is only one or 200 mistakes in the genome of the primates. There are over 4,000 mistakes in the human genome. Some of them which are fatal, some of them which will kill you before you're age 20, if they manifest. Often they're recessive, but if they do manifest, if they, if they do get expressed, they're fatal. So why would beings evolve with that level of, of mistakes? And the, for, uh, the final piece I want to mention is this. All the primates have 24 pairs of chromosomes. You get 24 from the father, 24 from the mother. So there's 48 chromosomes in all of the primates, except human beings. Human beings have 46. They have two uh, groups of 23 that they get, from one from the father, one from the mother. And when you examine it, what, what is numbers two and three in the primates is fused in the humans into number two. So why would evolution collapse two of them, number two and three, down to a single one, and thus create some kind of evolutionary leap? Why would the shrinking of chromosomes result in this huge advance? So for those five reasons, genetically speaking, it seems to me that it is very, very possible that the human, human genetics have been manipulated sometime in the last 200,000 years to create these extraordinary advances. So that's the third piece of evidence I advance. Uh, the next piece then will be the great wisdom traditions. When you look at the scriptural traditions of the world, it's as plain as the nose on your face that they're talking about extraterrestrials. And I just mentioned three great traditions. The first one, at the risk of boring you to death, because I've spoken about them on divers occasions, drop a hat and I talk about the Anunnaki. But the first, that's the first one. The Sumerian uh, scriptures are probably the oldest on the planet. They go back to uh, 3800 BC. And they speak very, very definitely. There are hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, documents on uh, stone tablets and on baked clay um, talking about uh, these beings. Anunnaki literally means those who from heaven, Anu, uh, to earth, Ki, came down. So those who came from heaven uh, to earth. And they talk about these beings who discovered the planet and they give a date to it 445,000 years ago. They came down to mine gold to repair a problem in the, in the atmosphere of their own planet called Nibiru. And they found the work to be very, very backbreaking, particularly when they had to transfer the operation from uh, the Middle East, where it was available in the water, to South Africa, where they had to dig deep underground to get it. So they created a slave race to do this work for them, according to the Sumerians. They took existing hominids, let's call it Homo erectus, and they cross-fertilized uh, eggs from uh, Homo erectus with sperm from the Anunnaki males, and there's an entire protocol given of how they actually did this, and it resulted in what they call the Adam, the, uh, the first worker. And so they created a slave race, according to the Sumerian scriptures. Um, at some stage, they tweaked these, the genes of these creatures, so let's call these Homo sapiens then. So the crossbreeding between the Anunnaki males and the terrestrial um, Homo erectus results in Homo sapiens. 
they continued to tweak Homo sapiens genetically until they got a Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and then something else began to happen. Then they began to uh, copulate, literally, with some of these Homo sapiens sapiens. And so now you get a whole group of kind of crossbreeds, everywhere between 100% Anunnaki uh, to 100% Homo sapiens sapiens, and everything in between, depending on whom was mating with whom. Um, at some stage, they decided to abort the whole thing and to uh, wipe it out because they were concerned that this crossbreeding activity and they created a flood that was intended to wipe out uh, all of the non-Anunnaki uh, beings. But one of them, Enki, uh, who was the geneticist among them, uh, gave the heads up to a guy called Ziosudra, the equivalent of Noah in the Hebrew scriptures. And he gave Ziosudra 120 years, and he helped him to collect the DNA of all life forms on the planet and to store them on a submersible, which was then piloted by an Anunnaki and survived the flood. So in the Sumerian account, where it's not Noah who takes animals two by two into a, 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 a craft that rides the waves, but the DNA was extracted and stored in a submersible piloted by an Anunnaki and that survived the flood and then got uh, recreated afterwards. So that was, the, um, that was the, the Sumerian story. Hinduism is again one of the oldest scriptural traditions and in the Vedas it speaks constantly of four classifications of beings. The first one is earthlings. And when they talk about earthlings, they're not just talking about humans, they're talking about the primates, all the kind of the, uh, um, uh, the ones that we are related to. They talk about a second group called the Asuras. And the Asuras are an extraterrestrial group who are into breeding, genetical modification, and conquest. And they move around uh, in the galaxy looking for uh, planetary systems that they can conquer and that they can create experimentation on, according to the Hindu scriptures. Uh, they're not to be trifled with. They're not good guys. There's a third group that they call the Devas. And the Devas also, according to Hinduism, are also an extraterrestrial group with very advanced technology. But their shtick is to try to create love and harmony. And so when they find a place that the Asuras have messed up, they come to try to bring it back into alignment. And the fourth group are called the Celestials. And the Celestials are, are ultra-dimensional or trans-dimensional. But they come into this planet occasionally, they manifest and they're called avatars. So according to the, the Vedic scriptures, you know, there are at least three different kinds of extraterrestrials. And then you look at the evidence in the Bible itself. For most of us, we believe that the Bible is the revealed word of God. What's the evidence there? There's evidence for genetics and interbreeding right there in the Bible when you read it properly. The first statement is, in the very beginning of Genesis, in chapter uh, 1 of Genesis, we hear the statement, Elohim, which is a plural word in Hebrew, meaning uh, the gods. The gods had a conversation, and the conversation went like this. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. Now, who is the us? The us, obviously, is a variation of the Sumerian legend of the Anunnaki gods. Let us make man in our image and likeness. It's not, a, it's not a royal we. It's a plural in the Hebrew. So who are the beings determining to create uh, humans in their image and likeness? Um, once they've been created, we find in Genesis chapter 6 a very strange statement. The experiment is up and running, and there are now human men, and there are human women, and then there are what are called the sons of God. And we are told in Genesis chapter 6, the sons of God found the daughters of men very favorable, and they took them as many as they wanted to wife, and they created a race who were giants. Now that's Genesis chapter 6. So who are the sons of God, and who are the daughters of men? It's very obvious the daughters of men were kind of homo sapiens sapiens. So who in God's name are the sons of God? Now, are they kind of um, some kind of divine beings without physicality? If so, why would they find physical women attractive enough to mate with them and create a species? And the Bible gives them two words. They're sometimes called the Anakim, which is very like Anunnaki. And they're sometimes called the Nephilim. So this race of giants, which is fathered by the sons of God and mothered by the daughters of men, you find in Genesis chapter 6. Now, without attempting to be in any way crude, Jesus himself obviously then is a half-breed. 
We know Jesus had no physical earthly father. He's got a physical earthly mother. So Jesus falls right into the genre of the sons of God, you know, having intercourse with the daughters of men. Mary is impregnated, not through any human man, but some other kind of being. So even Jesus himself somehow falls into this category of some kind of a cross-fertilization or a half-breed, and I'm not using this, that term derogatively, some kind of a half-breed between some kind of a divine being and a human mother. You've got lots of evidence for extraterrestrials and UFOs in the scriptures themselves. Angels, who are the angels that appear in the Bible constantly? You get angels appearing to Abraham, you get them appearing to Lot, you get them appearing to Tobit when he was looking for a wife, you get them appearing to the angel, to, the, to, to Mary, the mother of Jesus, you get an angel freeing Peter from prison in the Acts of the Apostles. Peter is locked up and an angel comes in and he puts a spell on the, the soldiers, they all fall asleep and he opens the doors of the prison and the gates of the prison and he sends Peter. So who are these angels? Are these angels ultra-terrestrials? that can shapeshift and come into physicality, or do they exist in some kind of another physical location? Whoever they are, they're not, they're not terrestrials. They're definitely then extraterrestrials. Jacob has a famous encounter with them where he actually sees, it doesn't describe the landing craft, but it describes some kind of a ladder coming down from a landing craft, and these are coming down from it. <coughs> and they are, at least on that occasion, they have physical articulation because Jacob physically wrestles with one of them and it throws him and it tears a nerve, his sciatic nerve, and he limps for the rest of his life. So whatever he saw, wherever he was, there were, he saw beings coming down a ladder, which looks suspiciously like a craft that lands and puts down landing gear, and these guys are coming down, and Jacob interacts with them. You find in, Eze in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel describes a very strange uh, craft which has four wheels inside four wheels that landed uh, where, he, where he was looking. And in actual fact, uh, a modern scientist, a German scientist, on the basis of the description in the, in the book of Ezekiel, has recreated a flying craft uh, with the specification, that the very same specification that you find in the book of Ezekiel, a craft that flies. And so what was that? You find in the, in the Bible that there's evidence of abductions. On at least two occasions, human beings are taken up by some kind of an extraterrestrial craft, and they're never heard of again. And the first one is Enoch. In the book of Genesis, uh, the, the patriarch Enoch, we are told, was taken up and walked with the gods. So there's a list of the patriarchs in the book of Genesis. And it gives their ages. It says, for instance, Adam uh, lived to be 930 years, and then he died. His son Seth lived to be 912 years, and then he died. You know, it goes right over to the list. Methuselah lived to be 969 years, and then he died. But in the middle of the list, there's a guy called Enoch, and it says, Enoch lived 365 years, and then he was taken up, and he walked with the gods. Now, his longevity is tiny in comparison with the rest of them were about eight, 900 years. His is 365, and then he was taken up and walked with the gods. All the others, we were told, they died of Enoch alone, it says. He didn't die, he was taken up, and he walked with the gods. And the second character is Elijah. So in the uh, book of Kings, you find the story that as Elijah is walking with his disciple Elisha, a craft comes down, a fiery chariot comes down, and they jump to one side, and Elijah is taken off in the craft. So right there in the Bible, you have evidence of what we would describe as abduction. Now, whether there were willing participants or unwilling participants, the truth is they were taken away in some kind of a craft. So there's lots of evidence in the, uh, in the wisdom traditions of the presence of extraterrestrials, crafts, abductions, and interactions between humans and uh, non-humans. The fifth bunch of evidence um, is mythology. You can think that mythology is um, stories that you know, uh, non-sophisticated people tell each other in the absence of having any kind of good science, that they sit around fires and they make up stories. Now, it's interesting to me that every place I've ever lived on the planet, and every language I've ever lived on the planet, they have stories that talk about sky gods that created us. They talk about a deluge that wiped us out. They talk about wars among the gods. They talk about a past golden age. And they talk about lost civilizations. And in actual fact, when you examine the literature, in over 200 different uh, civilizations on our planet, all these themes are covered in great detail. So is this just coincidence? Is this some kind of uh, archetype from the collective unconscious? Or is this some kind of race memory 
that deeply impregnated into all civilizations are the memories of the times when they actually interacted with these quote-unquote gods, these extraterrestrials. In Ireland, for instance, um, and all over Celtic Europe, um, there was the notion of the fairies. And when you look at the notion of the fairies, fairies are either what I would call, to coin the term, intraterrestrials, so beings who live inside the Earth, as I think from extraterrestrials who live someplace else, or terrestrials like us who live on the surface, or ultra-terrestrials who are shapeshifters. So I'm going to call these intraterrestrials. But certainly in the folklore of Europe, and in the Celtic Europe particularly, and in Ireland, these fairies they have two great characteristics. They're very, very tiny people, and they have extraordinary powers. And they abduct human babies on a regular basis to somehow upgrade their own genetic stock. So you get cases of abduction constantly. I've told you many stories from my childhood about what we, we in Ireland we call them, shiofra. A shiofra is when a human baby is abducted and a lookalike, a, a changeling, is uh, put in its place. And the changeling is always a very, very cantankerous little child. And so these fairies may be a kind of a medieval uh, articulation of encounters with uh, space creatures whom we didn't understand and with technology which is way above ours. Now this is getting on a little bit dangerous ground but I'm gonna go out there anyway. <coughs> okay. You're asleep but you may lose your faith in the process. <coughs> when you examine the Marian apparitions of the last 150 years, and you examine the actual reports that the children give, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that what was happening was some kind of extraterrestrial encounters. And I'll just give you three of the main ones. And the first one is Lourdes, 1858. When this little girl, Bernadette, encountered had her first vision, we are told it was accompanied by the sound of a rushing wind, and that the woman who appeared to her, she used a specific phrase, <coughs> Lourdes is in the Pyrenees, and they speak a specific kind of dialect there. When she described this being that she encountered, which would subsequently be called the Blessed Virgin Mary, the term she used in the Pyrenean dialect was un petito uh, damisala, which translates as uh, the petite little lady. So this was a very small, this wasn't a full-blown woman with, uh, that you know, was towering over Bernadette. Bernadette was towering over this uh, lady clad in white. So the term she's using is actually a term which was used in that area. It's an area where fairy lore was very, very common. And that very cave that Mary appeared in was well known as a place where the white fairy godmother uh, appeared. And so the very language that Bernadette is first using, I, I'll take questions at the end on. The very first, uh, the very first encounter that she has with her is described as un petito damisella, this tiny little lady, which was the language that was being employed to talk about the fairy lore in that exact area beforehand. So is that coincidence? And it's accompanied by this kind of rushing sound. Okay. The second one was in Ireland. There's a famous shrine in Ireland called Knock. Knock is a transliteration of the Irish term Knoch, and Knoch literally just means a hillock. And in 1879, there was a famous apparition there. It was witnessed by uh, six women, uh, three men, uh, two little children, and three teenagers. For whatever reason, there were the, the demographics, the statistics. And uh, the people who were present reported that the first sign of it was a large globe of golden light. As the, the, uh, before the apparitions began, there was this large globe of golden light. And there were three figures appeared who were subsequently identified as Mary, the mother of, of, God, of Jesus, and the second was John the Evangelist, and I, I think the third one may have been Joseph, I can't remember who the third one was. But one of the people present was a woman called Bridget Trench, and Bridget Trench was so enamored of this that she rushed up to try to grab the Virgin Mary, or this woman that appeared, only to find that it was a totally non-substantial entity. She couldn't grab hold, there was nothing to grab hold of. It was totally real, but there was nothing to grab. And so, um, how would you, again, it got associated with the Virgin Mary. So, is it an extraterrestrial? It didn't have physical uh, substance whatsoever, but it was very, very real as far as they were concerned. <coughs> and the third uh, set of apparitions I want to talk about were the apparitions at Fatima in uh, 1917. 
So in this little girl, there were three kids uh, who saw this apparition. But in actual fact, in 1915, two years before this apparition, um, Lucy, who was one of the kids, also reported an encounter with a, a male figure, a diminutive male figure that she described as emanating light and being resplendent, light-filled creature. <coughs> that was two years before uh, the subsequent visions. Then in 1917, on uh, May 13th, 1917, uh, she and two of her comrades had a vision. And this time it was like the un petit damisella, a tiny uh, woman uh, dressed in white. And before it happened, there was a white cloud descended on a tree. And this vision came out of the white cloud. And there's the same noise, the same kind of rushing wind associated with it. Uh, she described her as this little woman, or this little lady. The same terminology that, that uh, Bernadette had used in, Fran in the Pyrenees long, long before it. <clears throat> Which is the descriptor used again in Portugal, you know, for the fairy kin, that same uh, phrase, the uh, little, little lady, petite little lady. Now, this petite little lady promised to come back in the five following months on the 13th of the month each time. So the first month, May, there's just the three kids. The second month, June, 50 people show up for the encounter. Um, the, third moon, the third month, uh, July, there are 4,000 people. The fifth month, August, there's 18,000 to turn up, but the kids aren't there because they've been arrested and they're in jail. So on the third, on the on August, they're not even there. So the mob goes down to the jail and releases the kids. <coughs> And for the final one in October, there were 70,000 people. So it goes from 3 to 50 to 4,000 uh, to 18,000 in um, September, and sorry, in, in August, to 30,000 in September to 70,000 in October. And that was the final one. And each of, the, okay, each of them uh, is associated with buzzing, humming sounds, <coughs> which you get a lot of modern UFO encounters have that same phenomenon. There's a white cloud appears over the tree in e each time, and there's a disk, a golden disk, that appears before the white cloud forms each time. <coughs> so either Mary, that's Mary's transport system, um, golden globes and white clouds, you know, are, it's an extraterrestrial, you know, with some kind of um, uh, Marian devotion, but certainly all the descriptors of modern encounters and the fairy lore of Celtic Europe are present in the descriptors. Now it's very interesting that on the second to last one, on the September occasion when there are 30,000 people present, there are two Jesuit debunkers among them who have come specifically uh, to poo-poo this. And they're, they're totally you know, converted by what they see. So they describe a craft coming down, down the valley towards the children, hovering over the tree, creating this cloud, and this woman emerging from the cloud. So these Jesuit uh, theologians who came to the bunker wound up being totally converted. Uh, also in the, in, the, uh, in the September one, there was a guy present with binoculars, and he trained the binoculars on the white cloud in the tree, and he claims to have seen some kind of a globe with landing gear coming down and beings coming out of it into the tree. So you get all the hallmarks of kind of um, uh, modern UFO encounters. So are you going to sleep tonight, Dan? Okay. 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 Good. So the sixth piece of evidence, ancient evidence, I'm going to introduce is ancient buildings. You, you look all over the world, and there are places all over the world, of which I'm just going to mention three, where you've got this most extraordinarily sophisticated buildings that cannot be rep reproduced even in our own times. I'll give you three examples. One of them is in Baalbek in the Lebanon. And there's a temple of Jupiter, which was built by the Romans there. But the Romans built on a pre-existing platform. And this platform has blocks of wood, solid blocks of, of uh, stone, which are over 800 tons in weight. There is no modern equipment that can lift those kind of weights. In fact, if you, got, if you could manage to get 40 big cranes around it right now, they'd be hard put to lift uh, one of these stones. The entire platform is constructed of uh, these 800 foot, 800 stone, um, ton stones, and they're at a height of 26 feet. Now, how do you get 800 tons of stone up 26 feet and create uh, a base? The Romans just built on that. In the Sumerian legends, they identified this exact spot 
as the spaceport for the Anunnaki in 400,000 uh, 400, years ago. The second one is a place called uh, Gobekli Tepe. It was discovered in 1994. A farmer saw a piece of uh, rock sticking out of his field, so he decided to pull it out because it was interfering with the fertility. So he dug around and tried to pull it out and it wouldn't come out. So he dug deeper and it still wouldn't come out. And he dug down three or four feet deep and it still wouldn't come out. And then they brought in a JCB, a big backhoe, and started digging. And they went down 12 feet. And then they called in the archaeologists. And they discovered an entire city built there with the most extraordinary kinds of hieroglyphics written in it. And it had been intentionally buried in sand 12,000 years ago. So this city was built 12,000 years ago, when allegedly we were Paleolithic man running around with our cudgels and our spear, stone spears, and we crafted this. Obviously, this was not of human origin, and it was covered up intentionally with sand. You know, the excavations are still going on there. It started in 1994. And then you take the pyramids. Typically, the pyramids are dated to about uh, 2500 BC. There is a lot of modern evidence that when you actually look at the weathering patterns on the Sphinx, which is attended upon it, and the weather, weathering patterns show that the Sphinx, at least, and the pyramids probably as well, go back at least 7,000 years further to about 10,000 BC. You take the pyramids, the construction of the pyramids. These are done with an extraordinary precision. The measure of uh, length at that time was called the cubit, and the cubit is the distance between from a man's middle finger to his elbow. That's what a cubit is. So in the Bible, they use this as a measuring tool. Obviously, it was standardized. But a cubit is the, different, the distance between the middle finger, the tip of the middle finger, and the elbow. And it's standardized. When you measure the perimeter of the, uh, of the pyramid, the Great Pyramid at Giza, it is exactly 365.4 cubits, which is the length of our, uh, our solar year. Exactly, 365.4 cubits is the measure of the base of the Great Pyramid. And if you look at the, uh, the correlation between the perimeter of the uh, pyramid and the height of it, it's exactly 2 pi. It's the ratio between uh, a radius and the circumference of any circle. And it was an ancient uh, uh, spiritual, mystical practice to try to square the circle. Here is the perfect circle squared. The base is a square, you know, and with the relationship between the height of the pyramid and the perimeter, is exactly 2 pi. Now, when you look at these, and there are hundreds of examples all over the world, what you find is you get, sometimes in South America, stones whose, uh, uh, chiseled out, which are 1,200 tons in weight. And they've been schlepped 30 miles from where they were mined and quarried, uh, up into the mountains, and used in buildings. Now, what can, there's no modern technology that could, that could lift those kinds of stones. And to think that people drag that over the ground. And then when they're assembled, literally, they're so well put together that you couldn't get it. This sheet of paper, you couldn't slide it in between two levels of the stones. So the specificity of it is really, really extraordinary. So for me, that's evidence that some creatures, not our, us, were responsible for these buildings. Yeah. The seventh piece of evidence I want to um, uh, adduce is ancient maps. There's a map called the Ptolemaic map. The Ptolemaic map uh, was discovered in 1424. It shows an island off the west coast of Ireland, which is called High Brazil. And in fact, that's what we called it when I was a kid growing up. We still called it that in English, but we had two terms for it in Gaelic. One of them was called Tir Fahaun, which means the land under the waves, and the other one was called Tir Nanog, which means the land of the ever young. And it's an island off the west coast of Ireland, and it's shown on this map, the Ptolemaic map from 1424. The only problem was that island was covered up 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. It was covered up. So how did somebody in 1424 manage to map an island which was submerged you know, tens of thousands of years beforehand? You can see this island today from Google Map. And when you Google it, it has the exact contours and the exact size of the Ptolemaic map of 1424. Now, you tell me who figured that one out. The second map is called the Piri Reyes map. It was discovered in 1513, and it's a map of showing the, uh, the uh, east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa in the correct lines of longitude and latitude. Now, we didn't discover latitude until the 1780s, but here on this map, going back to 1513, we have the exact longitude latitude of these corresponding pieces. 
And according to Piri Reyes, he left notes on it. He said he had 20 source maps as he created this, some of them going back to Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great had maps wherever he got them showing the longitude and latitude of the east coast of South America and the west coast of Africa. And then a map called Orantius Phineas from 1531. It shows Antarctica and it shows the exact contours of Antarctica. Now we didn't develop radar capable of penetrating two miles of ice until the year 1958. So we couldn't map the contours of, Antar Africa, of Antarctica until 1958. When you superimpose the map of Orantius Phineas on the map through our radar system, it matches perfectly. So somebody, a way, way back, knew what Antarctica looked like. Who was that guy? Or who were those people? And the last piece of ancient evidence I want to adduce is nuclear explosions. According to the Sumerian legend, um, then the Anunnaki brought uh, nuclear weapons with them when they landed on planet Earth, but they hid them. And they hid them for hundreds of thousands of years. And then sometime in the around 2000 BC, there was a dispute between two Anunnaki factions, the sons of Enki and the sons of Enlil. And they discover where these weapons are held and they deploy them and they wipe off what are called the cities on the plain. The cities on the plain were the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and three other cities that aren't mentioned in the Bible. And there were five nuclear strikes in that area uh, in the year 2024 BC. And the date is very specific in the Sumerian legends. So nuclear weapons were deployed which account for uh, the, the kind of the terrain and the fact that the Dead Sea, which supports no kind of life, is still there. At the end of that deploying, the winds carried the radiation uh, toward the east, to where the Anunnaki themselves were living, in Babylon. And they had to abandon ship, literally, and leave. And the descriptions of what this wind did is like reading an account of what happened at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all the same signs of radiation, the very same signs and radiation. Now in the Bible, this account is kind of watered down a little bit, and it's called, it talks about fire and brimstone coming from heaven. Now, do we really think that God, as we understand God's source, was raining down fire and brimstone uh, to punish the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah? This is a very thinly, it's a, a kind of a diluted form of the Sumerian legend of the deployment of nuclear weapons. Now, you get the very same thing happening in the Vedas. The Indian scriptures talk about exactly the same thing. They talk about vimanas, uh, warships that fly and that deploy all these kinds of arsenals. And it's interesting to me that Robert J. Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, was a, uh, most people don't know this, he was a very highly respected Sanskrit scholar. And after the first atomic blast, he quoted from the, the, he, the, from the Sanskrit scriptures. He said, I have become death. And when he was uh, interviewed, the first interview he did, after the nuclear device had been exploded in Alamogordo, he was asked by the reporter, is this the first time ever that atomic device has been deployed and exploded on planet Earth? And the interviewer is thinking, did you guys do other tests before you did this one in Alamogordo? He gave a very enigmatic reply. He said, yes, this is the first time in recent memory. He was aware that the Vimanas of uh, the Hindu scriptures had spoken about this very, very thing uh, on former occasions. So that's kind of the ancient evidence then, those uh, eight pockets of material. I'm going to switch now and go on to uh, uh, modern evidence for extraterrestrials. And the first piece, um, I cover a bunch of stuff, abductions, near-death experiences, and crop circles. John E. Mack was a very famous Harvard psychiatrist who got a Pulitzer Prize for, a, for a, a novel he wrote and also was a very, very highly regarded uh, psy psychiatric researcher in Harvard. At some stage in the 1980s, he was, he was asked to interview somebody who claimed to have, had, have been abducted by extraterrestrials. And he interviewed this person and he found that as far as this person was, was concerned, he was telling the truth. Whatever happened to this person, this person was totally convinced that it really happened to him. And Mac put him through a whole bunch of battery of tests. And it was obvious this man was not psychotic. He was not hallucinating in any way. He was totally congruent 
with his experience and showed no signs of any kind of psychopathology whatsoever. Over the next 20 years, John Mack would interview hundreds of such people. And in all cases, he, would, he found out that these were very normal people. There was no pathology involved. And they all had experiences which had totally transformed and in some cases, unfortunately, shattered them. He published a bunch of material and Harvard attempted to fire him. He was thrown out of the Department of Psychiatry and he brought a legal case against him and after a year and a half he was reinstated. So uh, he spent the rest of his life investigating this. Unfortunately, he was killed in a very tragic accident in London. He was in London for a conference on crop circles when he was killed and knocked down by a drunk taxi driver. So he's left an extraordinary legacy, a lot of really good stuff on YouTube, where he's interviewing people involved, including even a group of little children in Zambia, 13 and 10 to 13 year olds, who had an encounter with a craft that landed in their playing field and frightened the daylights out of them. It's a very interesting video to watch that. So John Mack was convinced that these abduction experiences were totally real as far as the experiences were concerned and that they were not correlated with any kind of psychopathology on the part of the, the witnesses. Kenneth Ring is a psychologist, a research psychologist at the University of Connecticut, uh, Yukon. He's written a lot of books on the topic of near-death experiences and then laterally he began to look at the similarities in the kind of the psychological profiles between people who've had near-death experiences and people who've had UFO encounters. And he's written a fascinating book called The Omega Project. And he called it The Omega Project after Tyler de Sharda because he believed that there's a lot of psychological evidence accruing over the last hundred years that the human species is being prepared for some kind of a psychological shift in consciousness toward what I would call excuse me, Christ consciousness. So he's mapping this trajectory out. And what he did was he surveyed a whole bunch of people and uh, it's obvious in any Gallup surveys that have been taken recently in the United States of America show that more, well, more, well over half American people believe that UFOs and ETs are real. And the interesting correlation is this. The more highly educated a person is, the more likely they are to believe that UFOs and ETs are real. So uh, Kenneth Ring has surveyed these people. He's run them through battery of psychological testing and what he found is that people who've come back from near-death experiences and people who've had encounters with UFOs, there's a tremendous similarity of psychological profiles. Not any kind of pathology but a psychological profile where they seem to have an extraordinary ability to shift states of consciousness very very easily. It's a well-known phenomenon that about 2% of humans have a natural ability uh, to shift states of consciousness without employing any kind of hallucinogens or meditative practices or fasting, that it happens spontaneously. He's identified these and what he's seen is that uh, both the NDEers, those having near-death experiences, and those having UFO encounters are all claiming that they're being alerted to either the possibility of a breakdown in human civilization are a breakthrough for human civilization. And these are kind of, they're being commissioned and being sent back to try to wake up the rest of us to the realization that we're either going to destroy this experiment completely or we're going to shift in consciousness and break through into a different kind of world. That's the first kind of, of uh, modern evidence. When I did the session on crop circles, I examined many, many different possible explanations. The one uh, passage I want to take out of that lecture I gave was an interview that was done with an English architect. And there's just one little passage that really caught my attention. He said, uh, the crop circles are not messages, they're communications. A message is when you ring home and say, honey, I forgot to turn off this, the, 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 the gas under the stove. Can you turn it off? He said, that's a message. A yeah, communication when you go home and you cuddle your wife and you stroke her hair. That's a communication. So to put it in his words, he said, the crop circles are a communication that say, we are here and we care. We are here and we care. That there are some kind of extraterrestrial civilization or civilizations that are obeying the prime directive that they can't directly interfere, but they're here and they care. Number 11, so the third piece, I want to look at then uh, civilian encounters with uh, modern UFOs. And the first one I mentioned happened in January of 1987. 
a Japanese 747, a cargo uh, 747, on its way from uh, Juneau, Alaska, uh, to uh, going back to Japan, encountered two enormous UFOs that harassed it, in pilot's words, for 31 minutes. He had a visual on it, as did his two, his two co-pilots. He had it on radar, and he had a radar which can estimate the exact size of the UFOs. He calculated they were, bi they were bigger than aircraft carriers, than an aircraft carrier. Ground radar had uh, evidence of it. Military ground radar had evidence of it, and his own onboard radar. So there's three different radars uh, saying, yes, we have, we have a contact, and there's the visual that he has. It, at some stage, it, it was able to deploy, there were two of them, it was able to deploy so quickly, at some stages it's on his right wing, immediately afterwards it's on his left wing, then it's underneath him. And at one stage, it's right in front of him, so intensely that the cockpit is blinded and he can feel the heat on his, on his face. He, for, he tried all kinds of maneuvers and he couldn't shake it off for 31 minutes. Now, the FAA were, were sent to investigate. They sent a guy called John J. Callahan. And John J. Callahan collected the military data, the ground data from radar, the onboard radar, and the tapes of the conversations between traffic control and the pilots. And he had them synchronized by his IT guys. And he presented it uh, to the FAA panel. And then he was invited to present it to uh, Ronald Reagan's scientific uh, uh, board, uh, committee. And he presented it to them. But there were three CIA agents present. This is John Callahan's own report. And having seen all of the evidence, it was very, very obvious this was a real encounter, the CIA guys stood up and they said, it never happened, this meeting never occurred, you guys are sworn to secrecy, and we're taking the data. And they absconded with the data, except what they didn't know was Callahan had made copies of all this material. He um, resigned the year afterwards, 1988. He held on to the material for 20 years, and in 2008, he revealed it. So all that stuff is available right now. And so he, he said the attitude of the CIA was, every problem has a solution. If there's no solution, then there's no problem. Not the other end. Every problem has a solution. So if there's no solution to a problem, the problem doesn't exist. Take the data. It never happened. You are never here. Uh, the data don't exist. I, he ended up his, um, his speech with the following statement, which I loved. He said, who are you going to believe? Your own lying eyes are the government. <laughs> so that's the first civil encounter, civilian encounter I had to mention. The second one happened in Belgium in the year 1990, beginning in November 29th, 1990. And this was verified by uh, the Major General Wilfred de Brouwer, who was uh, Deputy Commander of the uh, uh, Belgian Air Force at the time. And he's on record and has written about it and has appeared on television talking about this. There was a wave of sightings of a huge triangular delta-shaped craft, 120 feet uh, each side, began to appear. Uh, huge headlights that lit up literally entire fields as they, as they moved. They moved really, really slowly and then took off at just lightning speed and disappeared. There were over 2,000 reports, 650 which were investigated by the Belgian Air Force, <coughs> and 500 of them found to be unexplainable, except that there was extraterrestrial craft. Um, funnily, none of these registered on any radar, so they had some radar dodging equipment. But they were so low and so slow that literally there were 2,000 different reports. And on one occasion, a police car which was following them, it was going slowly enough that you could actually drive along in, in, uh, to escort it. At one stage, when the policeman decided for the fun of it, he blinked his headlights on and off and the craft blinked its headlights on and off in response to it. So it was the 1990. The third one I want to mention happened uh, called the Phoenix Lights. On March 13th, 1997, there was a wave of huge delta-shaped craft uh, between 8 o'clock, 8 p.m. on that night, and 9.15 p.m. So for 75 minutes, a whole wave of these craft went over Arizona and over the city of Phoenix in particular. Uh, they were massive, they were solid, they were silent, and they were slow. They just ambled along. And some of, the, some of the witnesses said they were so low that literally I felt like I could throw a stone and hit it. They were seen by thousands, including the then governor of Arizona, a guy called Fife Symington, who initially started to make fun of it 
but then later admitted that he'd actually seen it himself and actually had followed it. And he was the next, he'd been a pilot for 20 years himself. And he began to appeal to the American government to start revealing you know, what's really happening here, have, having witnessed it himself. So in all, there are 70 uh, witnesses on record, police, pilots, and former, former military personnel you know, attesting to the reality of that particular wave. And the last one I'll mention um, for civilian encounters happened at Chicago O'Hare in 2006, November 7th. Over the United Airways terminal, gate C-17, there was a disk hovering. It was uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon, a uh, cloudy sky. There's a disk hovering over gate C-17. The person at the gate radios the control tower to say, can you get a visual on this guy? And so there's a record of the conversation that's going on. At some stage, it stayed there for about five minutes. It shot off through the cloud cover, leaving a perfect hole, absolutely perfect, so that the people on the ground could see through and could see the blue sky at the other side. Perfect perimeter, like a cookie cutter, clear, had shot right through it. Now, the FAA denied, denied it, and United Airlines deni denied it until the tape of the conversation between the, one of the people who witnessed it and the control tower became available, and then suddenly they began to make up all kinds of excuses, you know, trying to explain it away. So that's uh, civilian encounters. I want to shift now to um, military encounters, and I'm just going to mention two of those. The first one happened in Tehran in 1976. Um, General Parviz Jafari, who was then a major in the Air Force, was scrambled to intercept a UFO that had appeared uh, over Tehran. And he gave this evidence actually here in this country in 2001. He was scrambled and he chased this and he went an F-4 uh, jet fighter and he got visual on it, he got radar contact with it and he was told to fire on it. He had sidewinder missiles. He tried to deploy his sidewinder missiles and they jammed. He chased this thing for about 22 minutes, and every time he locked onto it and attempted to fire his missiles, his missile system just jammed up. So finally, they're approaching the Russian border, and he's ordered to come back, and he turns about, comes back, and there's the FO right in front of the landing strip. He has to do a maneuver to avoid hitting it on the way back in. Hang on. And he's attested to this you know, in this country just a few years ago. And the second one comes from Peru, and it was April uh, the 11th, 1980. Comandante Oscar Santa Maria Huertas, who was the crack uh, jet military pilot for the Peruvian Air Force. A UFO appears over a very sensitive military base over the runway. It looked like a balloon initially. They make radio contact and they tell it to desist and get out of military space. It totally ignores them, so they deploy Oscar Huertas. And this is their crack military pilot. He goes chasing after this guy. It leads him on a merry chase. He deploys his weaponry, which aren't missiles, but machine guns to no effect. They're just bouncing off this thing. There's a 23 minute chase in which he reaches speed, speeds of 1150 miles an hour. That's Mach 1.6. And finally, at an altitude of 63,000 feet, as he's chasing this guy, the UFO just stopped. All of just stopped right in front of him. The dead stop. And he had to uh, swing around to avoid it. And after 23 minutes, he's out of fuel, and he has to come back down uh, onto the runway. And that was witnessed by a 1,000 military witnesses. It was right over their own runway. So there are military encounters. So section D then. Uh, to see or not to see. So when you look at what's happening in Europe over the last 10 years, it's very different from what's happening here over the last 20 years. Uh, no, section 13 I call Europe peeps out of the closet. In 1999, a group of 13 French generals, scientists, and police people, uh, not associated with the government, they were all retired. One of them had been the, the head of the French equivalent of NASA, and the other is the national chief of police, and the other are scientists that had worked on, um, uh, on these kinds of projects. They're all retired. They spent three years assembling information and data and looking at these UFO encounters and figuring out which ones could be explained and which could not be explained. They issued a report in 1999 in which they'd looked at the unexplained ones that they'd gone into in great detail. And having looked at the, the scientific data available, they, their opinion was the most logical explanation is that these are extraterrestrial craft. 
they urged international action and particularly they advised the, Uni the uh, European Union to put pressure on the United States of America because they, their opinion was the United States of America was stonewalling on these, on these days. I'm aware of, well aware of it. And every single one of these men were personally hugely transformed by what they had seen and what they had studied. The Vatican itself, very, very recently, there's a Monsignor Carrado Balducci, who was actually the, um, a personal uh, friend of the last pope and was also the exorcist for the Diocese of Rome. He went on Italian television many times speaking about the reality of extraterrestrials and saying that they're not demonic and it's not a psychological aberration and we need to be investigating it and there's no, uh, there's no conflict of interest between believing in God and uh, encountering UFOs. Over the last few years, England and Mexico have made available all their UFO files, which brings us uh, to ourselves. Official US policy is cover up and stone one. And so it's been a case of ridicule and then violent opposition, misinformation, disinformation, and obvious lying because when the Freedom of Information Act allowed us to get documents about it, th these documents showed that previous assertions by the military and the government were totally lies that the stories they initially gave and the protestations they made were palpably false because their own documents, when they were covered under the Freedom of Information, showed, in fact, that they were telling lies and they knew that they were telling lies. In fact, the CIA has an entire protocol of debunking, how to handle any evidence of UFO activity. There's a whole protocol as to how to send out disinformation, misinformation, and debunk this. The former defense Minister for Canada, a guy called Paul Heller, is on tape, on videotape, and you can check this out on your internet connections, is on tape accusing the America, the United States of America, of holding information on UFOs that the Canadian government passed on to them. So the Canadian government uh, uh, has information that they passed on to the United States of America for action, and uh, we never did anything about it. And this man who is now retired, he was the defense, Minister for Defense, you know, is on tape, you know, berating the United States of America for this. The astronauts are beginning to come out of the woodwork and talk about this. The most famous, perhaps, Gordon Cooper, who talked on tape and video of two personal encounters he had. One in 1951, when he was stationed in Europe, and one in 1958, where there were, he's training pilots in the Nevada desert, and a, a UFO landed right beside them. And he told the guys they were actually filming the training exercise. He asked them to film this, and they filmed it. And he developed the film, and he reported to his, uh, to his superiors that he had film, and they told him to send it on immediately. He sent it on, and it was never heard of again. He wrote a letter to the United Nations, Gordon Cooper, asking them to please investigate the UFO phenomena. He asked for a meeting and got it with Kurt Waldheim, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations in 1976. And Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, who was on Apollo 14, is on record just in the last two or three years talking about his total acceptance and belief in extraterrestrial life and UFO encounters. Dr. Richard Haynes, who worked at NASA Ames, <coughs> He worked on the Gemini projects and on the Apollo projects, retired in 1988. He has assembled 3,400 cases of commercial, military, and private pilots' encounters with UFOs. And finally, maybe our uh, best uh, shot at all, there's an extraordinary character called Dr. Stephen Greer, a medical physician who for the last 20 years has devoted himself to what he calls the Disclosure Project where he's contacted uh, scientists, former intelligence agents, um, government personnel who are willing to come in front of camera and talk about their experiences and their knowledge. So the first such meeting happened at the National Press Club on the 9th of May in 2001. And you can find this is on, available uh, on uh, video in which 20 different intelligence, government and science experts are on camera talking about their own personal witness around UFOs, EBEs, and other technologies. And each of them ends his presentation by saying, and I'm prepared under oath to testify to this in front of the United States Congress. 
So I'll finish by saying this. The famous Swedish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said, there are two ways to be fooled. One is to believe something that's not true, and the other is to refuse to believe something that is true. Patricia. So Patricia's question is this. She's aware of the fact that the United States is covering up in stonewalling, but aren't other countries having experiences and talking about this? Um, the geopolitical reality is that nothing gets revealed unless there's an American say so. So these governments privately are releasing documents. England has done it, Mexico has done it, the Belgian government has done it. Um, but as far as kind of uh, the world community is concerned, they're waiting for American lead for several reasons. Because very, very often, even when there are downed, and there have been some downed extraterrestrial craft, there's a very famous book written called The Day After Roswell, written by um, Colonel Joe Corso, who was the chief of staff in the um, Eisenhower government for scientific inquiry. He wrote a book called uh, The Day After Roswell. And he claims that uh, there was a real craft that was downed in Roswell, New Mexico in July 1947 and that there was stuff uh, lifted from this and that it was retro-engineered. And his job on behalf of the uh, um, Eisenhower government was to piecemeal this out to particular companies like uh, uh, IBM and um, big uh, research corporations, not tell them where it was from, tell them we got this from a Russian craft or whatever, can you figure out how it works and retro-engineer it. And here's a whole list that he believes actually go back to that period of time, that a lot of the great you know, modern uh, movements, technological movements, go back to uh, information recovered uh, from these. Now, to answer your question directly, uh, it has been the practice then that even when uh, information or um, technology is recovered any place in the world, it's been funneled into the United States because we're, you know, we have the technology to be able to retro-engineer it. So all this stuff is coming through here. So even though individual governments are making kinds of statements about this stuff, the technology has been funneled in here and the artifacts are being kept here. Margaret, you get the, um, one take, you get the microphone. All the stuff that you were telling us, I've, I've never heard of that before. Okay. Um, but one thing that, that um, I, I know is that in this big crowd of people, you say 70,000, the sun was supposed yes. to have yes. whirled around yes. and come towards them yes. and stopped and then gone back. Yes. Could that have been? Well, which do you think is more likely scientifically or more plausible? It's possible, obviously. But which is more plausible? Then uh, an extraterrestrial craft, a disc-shaped craft, you know, got between them and the sun, shot towards them, and what we were told is that it zigzagged. It didn't just come hurtling right down. It zigzagged, and you get a lot of this in many modern UFO encounters. <coughs> when these craft are landing, uh, some of them come just straight down, hovering and land. A lot of them are like falling leaves. They zigzag on the way down. But it is quite possible that anybody who would be trying to put on a show be very easy, you know, get between the crowd and the sun, and then plummet towards them at 100 speed, stop, and back off at the same speed. For me, that seems much more likely scientifically than that the sun itself, you know, 93 million miles away, started doing this number. Yeah. Okay. Then, and then. Just grab the microphone first. So one is kind of a comment and the other is a question. <laughs> the question is more interesting, but I'll start with the comment. So um, Seth Shostak was one of our speakers. Yes. And I think you all know that yes. this is at TED. Yeah. And his yeah. talk went up on TED.com, which is a big honor and quite rare. And the last I looked, it's over 400,000 people have watched it since it was out in, I think, June or July. I kind of forget when it was posted. So that was the comment. The question is, <laughs> what do we do with all this information? OK, what do we do with all this information? Um, there, when I was preparing for this talk, I spent, I spent many, many days, you know, I, sp I spent years researching this topic. I spent the last four or five days you know, just downloading ideas onto paper. And I started off with you know, 45 pages of just 12-point uh, 
script. So I had to prune hugely to try to lick it down to an hour and a half lecture. So one of the sections I left out was this. Um, it's been fascinating to me as a psychologist to look at uh, human narcissism and the ways in which just item by item we're beginning to realize we're not the center. So we all start off life believing you know, I'm the center of the family. And then we grow up and realize I'm not. You know, there's three or four, I have five other brothers and sisters, so it's not all about me. But at least, you know, you know, our family unit is special. And then I go to school and I realize that there are little Johnnies from a whole bunch of other families. Our family isn't special either. And so um, the notion that the ego is the center of the psyche got totally blown out of the water by Carl Jung. He showed that the ego is just the center of waking consciousness. It's not the center of the psyche, the, the self or the capital S is. So we had to let go of the fact that, you know, the ego is the center, or that I'm the center of the family. Then we had to let go of the notion that the human race is special. So all the other creatures, you know, even if God created them, we are special. And then evolution, including Darwin, but evolution is much older than Darwin. It goes way, way back. Evolution shows that we're just one more stage in an evolutionary process and there will be others way beyond us elsewhere. And so we're not special. God didn't make a kind of a special creation for human beings. We're just the natural sequence of an evolutionary projectile, assisted perhaps by extraterrestrials. So now we're not even special as humans. Then we figured out at some stage, but our planet is the center of the universe, of the solar system. Copernicus blew that out of the water. Our planet is not the center even of the solar system. And slowly by slowly we find in the, our solar system is not the center of the galaxy. We're on one little spiral arm on the very edge of five arms of a huge galaxy. <coughs> the galaxy is only one of 150 billion galaxies. So one by one by one, you know, all the things that made us special are being blown out of the water. And this appears to me, this notion that at least there's only one intelligent life form on the planet and it's us. If that's true, God help the universe. <laughs> If we're as intelligent as it gets, we're in big, big trouble. God, I, I give God a D minus if that's as intelligent as he created life. So this appears to me to be the next frontier that we have to let go of. What do we do with it? The first thing is realize it is ludicrous to claim that we're the only life form or the most intelligent life form. So now what do we do? We start preparing ourselves for a cosmic citizenship. And a cosmic citizenship means a shift in consciousness away from what I've called homo sociopathicus, this preoccupation with greed and violence into what I would call homo spiritualis, or a Christ consciousness, where we realize that all beings, extraterrestrials, extrasensory, um, ultra-terrestrials, they're all creations of source. And we're being prepared for the next stage. We're making, we're coming out of, you know, we've left home and we're going to preschool. Do you know? We're a type zero civilization. We're not even ready for school yet. We're ready for perhaps for a preschool. And preschool is letting go of these assumptions that we are the center. So it means re-examining how we do our agriculture, our education, our medicine, our religion, our politics, our finances, our media, all the things we've been studying over the last year. It's looking at how do we do thing, these things in a way that prepare us for cosmic citizenship and let go of this you know, narcissistic preoccupation with the navel-gazing of ourselves. Yeah. Yes, Um, do, are we a science experiment? I don't believe that to be the case. I constantly differentiate between the spirit and the spacesuit. So every spirit, every bite-sized piece of God that chooses to have uh, an incarnation is going to sign up for some kind of a dimension, you know, in which to encounter, you know, separation from source. Now, some of us do that in physical bodies. Others do it in non-physical you know, in other dimensional bodies. I think I shared with you one time um, a, a four-hour regression that a friend of mine did me on me, hypnotic regression, in which I experienced the period of time between my last incarnation, which ended in 1944, and my present incarnation, which started in 1946, the period in between those. And part of that experience, a very powerful part of that experience, was uh, being in what I can only describe as uh, the launching pad where souls were being prepared for mission in all different kinds of dimensions and encountering these souls and realizing as souls all bite-sized pieces of God. But as we sign up for missions, some of us opt for a physical incarnation, some for non-physical incarnation. So 
incarnation is a science experiment that we're conducting on ourselves. But as far as source is concerned, it's a way of all creatures learning that separation is an illusion. I'm coming. Okay. Uh, okay. Next one. Okay. I was wondering uh, why do you feel that our government has okay. suppressed this information for the last 50 or 60 years? So let me make sure I understand your question. Um, are you asking me why I feel they're doing it or yeah, why I feel yeah. they're doing it? So. Well, I, I, uh. I, it appears that they are oh, since yeah. okay. pilots okay. have been seeing yeah. this sure. since the 50s. And yeah. uh, why do you think that uh, the government uh, is suppressing this okay. information from the general public. For two reasons. The first reason is I'm totally convinced that, there, that we have uh, extraterrestrial technology from space, down spacecraft, and perhaps even from some kind of um, interaction or agreement with them. And that as the greatest, as the only superpower on the planet right now, we are using that you know, to, um, to maintain our superiority. When you look at, for instance, drone technology, where um, modern United States pilots are not going into planes at all anymore. They're sitting in dark rooms with headsets on them in totally dark situations, and they're uh, visualizing data coming at them, and they're directing drones, which are unmanned vehicles, with pinpoint precession, uh, precision to kill people in Afghanistan and Pakistan at the moment. Yeah. And so um, it confers an extraordinary advantage on any you know, military power that possesses a preponderance of this technology. That's the first reason. And the second reason, I believe, is the given reason is that uh, th uh, they're afraid that there would be total anarchy and panic, and that if people were to believe that, there's, that there are uh, uh, creatures out there much more advanced than us, that there are uh, aircraft in our skies over which we have no control, then people would lose lose confidence in the churches, in government, in the political process, and that there will be total mayhem and that there will be anarchy in this. My own opinion is that um, there is no such thing as a predetermined uh, out, uh, that the future is composed of the present day choices, that the future is merely the kind of um, the logical consistent outcome of the choices made by all the prayers in the present time. And people can... In so I am... Um, if the present trajectory were to continue, then very, very obviously, for economic reasons, for ecological reasons, uh, for military you know, the future it doesn't look at all bright. In fact, it looks catastrophic. We're uh, reaching a tipping point. On the other hand, it's been my, uh, it's been my experience as I... Sorry, Michael. Um, so my own opinion is, what is my own opinion? <laughs> Everything I've studied suggests to me that there has never been a significant shift in evolution which has not been precipitated by some kind of a uh, global or a cosmic crisis uh, from the very, very beginning. You look at our... I'm an equal opportunity messer. Uh, you can give me any battery. Literally in the first nanoseconds after the Big Bang, uh, what Banged was producing matter and antimatter in equal measure. So for every billion particles of matter, it was producing a billion particles of antimatter. Matter and antimatter meet each other, they annihilate and just produce pure energy. <coughs> so it looked like this was of those dud universes. However, something shifted. In the first nanoseconds, there was a slight recalibration. And for every one billion particles of antimatter, there was a billion and one particle of matter. And from that tiny, tiny imbalance, the entire universe has evolved. Now, is this coincidence or is this intelligent? I'm convinced that the meta-universe that had, that had uh, birthed this universe had experiences for billions of years beforehand and saw the problem and took evasive action immediately. The very same thing happened on um, the first life form on the planet was protozoa, single cell creatures. And for one point five, food of choice was hydrogen. And hydrogen is the most plentiful you know, um, molecule in the universe. So there was food everywhere they looked. They were able to extract hydrogen from sunlight through photosynthesis. They could extract it from soil and from rocks. And then they learned to extract it from water. But when you extract hydrogen from water, you're left with two oxygen molecules. And oxygen was a deadly toxin 
towards these four cells. So the more they ate, the more they wiped wipe themselves out. So they had to make an adjustment, and it developed a new kind of uh, cell, the mitochondria. The Not only can mitochondria survive oxygen, it eats oxygen and converts it into energy. So there's an agreement between using, uh, and I'll, I'll cook food for you. Female relationship. You provide the house, I'll, pr I'll provide the grub. And so inside in every cell, the, um, the cell provides protection for the mitochondria, produces food for the cell. Instead of wiping out the experiment, it thrived. And most life forms on the planet, particularly mammalian, our food is oxygen. So that there's been either cosmic, you know, nature has created a response. In some cul-de-sacs. And the one difference on this little planet at least between previous extinctions and this one is that this is the first time where there are beings on the planet, as far as we know, who can consciously cooperate with or obstruct this evolutionary trajectory. And at the moment, we're hell-bent on obstructing it and destroying it. But there's, there's a very significant group of people uh, creating a different kind of a meme and a different kind of a mindset. And you don't need to be in the majority. You need only to reach a critical mass. And little groups like ourselves all over the world are creating that mindset and networking so that there will, this movement is going to go asymptotic. You know, it, it's accelerating faster and faster and faster. And so within a period of just a few short years, there could be major shifts in consciousness or there could be a major break, breakdown. Tom and then Ingrid. Tom. Okay, grab the mic first, Tom. At least one of us will be heard. Actually, turn this off. My pacemaker will. <laughs> it's interactive with my pacemaker. Tom. I know, I'll repeat the question. <laughs> So Tom's question is this, you know, I've spoken a lot about extraterrestrials over the years and I'm talking a lot about that every soul is a bite-sized piece of God. So what about these extraterrestrials? Are they uh, more spiritually advanced than us or uh, just more technologically? Because he says I don't speak a lot about the, the spirituality of them. Um, I've differentiated constantly between the spirit and the space earth. The difference between um, uh, technology and soul and so it's very important for us not to be uh, disheartened uh, when we find ourselves you know, in the grip of uh, technologically uh, greedy or violent you know, civilizations because that is not our, our home and that is not our origin. At the same time, we're meant to influence that outcome. So what would I say about these civilizations? I am totally convinced that... Um, I actually thought about bringing a questionnaire tonight. I made out a questionnaire about 15 years ago. Uh, what my beliefs are about these extraterrestrials. Their moral evolution, their spiritual evolution, their technological evolution, whether they made contact with us in previous times or whatever. At some stage, maybe I'll share it with you. It's a list of questions I was asking myself. But my opinion is that um, it is like you know, any, any country or any uh, continent. When you look at what Europe did to Africa in the, particularly the 1700s and the 1800s, people left Europe to go to Africa. Some of them to conquer, as conquerors, they went as military colonialists. Some of them went to grab land and became farmers there. Some of them went to become missionaries and teach them about Jesus. And some of them went as anthropologists to kind of study the culture and the language. Some of them men, went to kind of uh, um, try to upgrade the standard of living of the local population. So there was a whole bunch of different motives from just one continent going to another continent. 
So I'm, I'm equally convinced that those extraterrestrial societies that have discovered a garden earth, you know, are, are the same. There are some of them who are uh, who have colonized it and planted a garden. There are some people who have done experimentation. There are some who are anthropologists wondering what are they going to do. There are some of them who really are very, very beneficent, but using the prime directive, they're not allowed to interfere directly. So they send avatars like the Buddha or Jesus to try to influence the, the, the outcome of human affairs. Hinduism very obviously addressed the issue because they talked about four groups. They talked about terrestrials, asuras, devas, and celestials. And the terrestrials were the humans and, and the primates. The um, asuras were the colonialist type and the breeders. The devas were the spiritual ones uh, trying to uh, you know, uh, go against the asuras. And the celestials were those who became avatars. And so it sneaks into all of these areas. But I am, I am totally convinced that the universe is so multifaceted, even the physical universe, that I am convinced there are millions of different physical life forms in the universe, some of whom are much, much more uh, scientifically advanced, but not morally. Some of them very morally advanced. Some of them, you know, um, as scientifically astute as, you know, Dr. Mengele in Hitler's time, and equally immoral. And so you get the entire spectrum of possibilities there. But that the really, the real spiritual ones may not live on the physical plane at all. They may be extra dimensional. They may have the ability, uh, because they're so evolved, to manifest on the physical level when it suits them. And maybe that's what angels are about. Or maybe that's what the like of, the likes of a Jesus are about. That the entity that manifested as Jesus as a physical person who was born, lived, and got crucified is just a particular spacesuit that a very advanced avatar chose to wear for a present encounter and intersex with planet Earth. So I think there's an entire spectrum of physical possibilities and a whole slew of non-physical, extra-dimensional time travelers, uh, shapeshifters, uh, some of whom are technologically astute but not morally advanced, and some of whom are deeply, deeply spiritual, you know, and want to intervene, except in a very, very gentle way. Ingrid. Okay. Worms is my specialty. Ingrid, and then Ingrid. Very love. This was such an activating, powerful talk to shift us into a cosmic consciousness, which I think we really need to bring into this, this new upcoming sh shift of time for us. Um, I found one of the answers I really get to tell me about why we have so much attention okay. about each information, it's because of their energy source. They're very advanced with energy. Mm -hmm. okay. They're very based on petroleum, yeah. chemical yes. kinds of... Yes. Uh, methods and technologies here, they're very advanced. That's a big reason they request that information. And of course there's both religion and the social and the political. All the forbidden archaeology, yes. biologies, yes. all those things. I've gone to a lot of um, yoga conferences and what I've learned they talk mostly about is the interplanetary awareness and connection we are and have. And that's the big shift we need to do in our own mind that there are so many levels of information and beings and consciousness and opportunities. And we are part ET, and we are part human, and we are part divine. Mm -hmm. We have all these different brands and aspects and potentialities. <coughs> and I think one of the most interesting, first I, I loved your metaphor about Earth as a garden. I heard one very advanced metaphysical speaker say, well, Earth is the psychiatric planet of the universe. <laughs> and then I heard it Ken Lu, who does the own opponent. He says, no, Earth is the rehabilitation. Okay center of the universe. And then I heard one of the more recent guys say, well, no, planet Earth is kind of like Studio 54. Mm. Anything can go. It's mm. just experimentation, right? But one thing is, it is a place to learn about yeah. I, I hope that gets onto the tape. That was a brilliant, brilliant intervention, Ingrid. Thank you so much. Um, I'll just make a comment on two aspects of it. You've covered a whole bunch of areas. <coughs> one of them is the, one of the reasons for uh, non-disclosure has to do with the, t the uh, energy issue. And in fact, on uh, Stephen Greer's site, they're, they're the twin foci of what he's trying to do. Uh, um, disclosure of the reality of extraterrestrial presence and also the availability uh, of other energy sources. And so that's a huge part. It's called the Sirius Project. It's a subcomponent of it. The second piece I want to comment on, uh, you said, you know, that we're part of a brotherhood. You know, I'm totally convinced that uh, unknowingly, that when the Roman Catholic Church preached the doctrine of the communion of saints, you were all brought up with that. 
Yeah? If you were brought up Roman Catholic, there's a belief system uh, called the communion of saints. And the communion of saints is the belief system that there are three groups of souls. That there's the church militant, which is us, we're on planet Earth and we're struggling against evil. And there's the church suffering, which is the souls in purgatory. And then there's a tri the church triumphant, which has gotten to heaven. Now, I don't particularly buy into that kind of languaging, but I think this is exactly what you're saying, Ingrid, that there is a communion of saints. And it's not just about people on earth, people in purgatory, and people in heaven. It is all sentient beings throughout this universe and other universes. We are all inextricably interconnected. We are all children of source. We're all bite-sized pieces of God. And therefore, there is a communion of saints. And we're meant uh, to find out who our brothers and sisters are. We're not meant to live in isolation. And we're being prepared to move out of the house, maybe into the neighborhood, like a little two-year-old for the first time, and look at the neighborhood. When we get bigger, we go to school, and our horizons will, will get much bigger. When we go to college, we move out of state, and then we got a big, different exposure. You know, when we graduate, we put a backpack on our backs and go to Europe and see another continent. So yeah. this, is, this is the first tentative steps in reaching out into this communion of saints. Okay. And then, this gentleman here. Oh. Oh. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So Helen is reiterating that we're, no matter where we are, in what kind of a spacesuit, in what dimension, however technologically advanced we are, you know, we're all from source. We're all um, products or manifestation from the same source. I don't know your name. What is your name? Connor. Clark. 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 You're very welcome. Do you have a comment? All right. Yes, actually, I wanted to share with everybody that there's some very positive developments okay. in, in this subject. Uh, uh, Dr. Greer, oh, yes. okay. uh, the disclosure project right. has teamed up with very recently yes. with uh, an Emmy Award winning documentary filmmaker named MRB Carita. They've raised over a uh, quarter million dollars to bring these kinds of issues in a sort of palatable way to a, to a wide audience. Mm. Uh, I've set up here uh, uh, a laptop, so if anybody is interested in learning more, you can come up after this and get your email address and get on the, uh, um, the, the mailing list. There's, uh, they need all the help that they can get because this is like a huge, huge issue, particularly the energy uh, mm. aspect of it. If, if, if the knowledge that these civilizations have in terms of bringing energy from the field of space-time around us were, were brought to, the, to public life, um, we could turn this planet into a rose garden. We could do it in you know, a generation, in 20 years. Totally eliminate poverty, totally reverse global warming, everything. So it's a, you know, it's a huge push, it's a Promethean task. We need all the help we can get. And I, I, I hope you guys will... Do you have a website that you can... Yes, yeah, you can go to Sirius. S I R I U S like the star <coughs> dot never ending light dot com. Sirius S I R I U S dot never ending light dot com. Light. 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 Yeah. Okay. 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 Dot com. Dot com. Yes. Go ahead, Clark. Okay, so, uh, and uh, Dr. Greer actually has a, a kind of a three-pronged approach, uh, as far as I can tell. One, the first one was uh, contact. Um, so he started something called the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and for the last 20 years has been taking people who are interested out uh, and teaching them how to make contact in the spirit of peace and universal love um, with these civilizations. Uh, the second was disclosure. Uh, which culminated in, in 2001 and is actually sort of re-culminating past the whole 9-11 era in uh, this documentary which is coming out. And the third is uh, the energy and trying to bring the, the knowledge of these energy sources which have not only been uh, reverse engineered from extraterrestrial technologies but also forward engineered by um, humans on this planet through the mind of men comes uh, this wonderful knowledge.
That was brilliant intervention. Thank you so much, Clark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Yeah. About this. You're new. You're new here. <laughs> we don't know you. Cecile. Yes. You're very welcome. It's great to have you. Great. Thank you so much for that. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Um, guys, uh, we promised at the beginning of this series that we would end at 9 o'clock so that people don't get um, tired. There's only one more uh, topic left in our, in our uh, curriculum, and that's um, in December, and it will be led by Lawrence Bird. It's the Military Industrial Complex. Now, I just want to run one idea by you. Uh, I've been thinking about this for the last few months, and uh, if there's interest in it, I would like to add two more um, sessions one in January in which I would like to do a, a recapitulation of all the topics we've dis discussed over the last year and just one lecture to pull it all together in one lecture and to see are there connectors between the, uh, the pieces. And then the last one would be a brainstorming session, including the kind of stuff that Clark has done so powerfully in the resources that Ingrid has to see what are the resources and what, we can come, what can we do you know, as individuals, as a community, uh, as little groups like COJ. So my proposal is to do two more sessions, one in f January and one in February, if there is interest in that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming, guys. God bless you and safe home.